Thanks. Hey, I'm Brad. Uh, I'm an engineer. I spend all day solving technical problems with my colleagues. At lunch, we talk about sports and engineering. Uh, I belong to uh, technical societies of engineering. I go to engineering conferences. You could say I'm an engineer. That's what I do. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's who I am. It's, it's, my, it's my group. It's, it's, my, it's my peer group. I would suggest, though, that each of you also can classify yourself as something. You're a craftsperson, a government worker, a technologist, a faith leader, an educator, a politician, a nonprofit employee. And for the sake of today's conversation, let's call those silos, right? We all live within, within some silo. Now, in my career walk, I've had the opportunity actually to participate in leadership in a number of different silos. Um, I've been amongst educators as an adjunct faculty. Um, I've worked as a structural engineer amongst other technologists. I've been on job sites with um, other construction workers and skilled craftspersons doing inspection. I've worked with the Air Force and government workers helping to transfer their technology out. Um, I actually started a nonprofit called the Dayton Service Engineering Collaborative, or DSEC, and worked with other nonprofits. I've been a staff ministry leader on a local church working on our engagement, both locally and internationally. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur. I'm actually part of a startup technology company right now as well. Now, I've stood near politicians, but I've actually had the wherewithal not to inhale there. <laughs> <laughs> but a few things that I've learned along the way with those different silos. Um, one, those, those silo groups, they have their own hierarchy, their own agenda, their own resources. Each group has their own uh, mechanism about going about the world. But one thing that I've noted that is the second piece of it, which is consistent amongst all the silos, is that in each of those silos, there's a concept of giving back, of wanting to do good. And they end up doing it within their community or within their own silo. I truly believe that uh, Johnny Normal has a, a penchant for doing well. He wants to give back to the world. And really, I think at the end of the day, people look at the bad stuff in our world and wish they could change it and wish they could do good. So real quick, let's, let's talk about some of the bad stuff in the world. And it's easy to globalize it and say 1.2 billion without access to clean water or health and sanitation issues, but let's make it real local. Let's talk about Montgomery County, Ohio. Population 535,000, right here in our own backyard, we sit smack in the middle of it right now, Montgomery County. In Montgomery County, one in five of us lives at or below the poverty level, 7,300 of which are single mother households. We have 33,000 children in Montgomery County who live in poverty. Over 3,300 children were born to single mothers in 2010, and we have a disproportionately high percentage of which um, have, of our uh, African Americans experience infant mortality. We have over 1,100 kindergartners in Montgomery County, that require intervention upon entering kindergarten. 28,000 unemployed, 87,000 on food stamps, 101,000 residents with food insecurity. The city of Dayton metropolitan area is fourth in the nation for food hardship. Folks, Montgomery County, this is just our small area, right? The needs are immense. But let me flip that over for a second and help you reflect on another side of that equation, which is quite different, which has to do with our regional resources. In the Dayton region, we have 27 institutions of higher education. We confer over 16,000 degrees each year. As far as from a jobs perspective goes, high paying good jobs in scientific healthcare and government jobs, we have hundreds of thousands located right here. And there are groups within each of those that want to do good. The United Way placed 5,000 volunteers. The Dayton Foundation gave out 38 million in gifts and grants in one year alone, 37, or 371 million in a decade. Amongst engineering professionals and technologists, we have societies that organize our, organize our societies. There's 46 different member institutions of the Affiliate Societies Council representing thousands of technologists. Now, let's reflect that back into Montgomery County and just look at what the IRS data says, right? We have 632 different public charities in Montgomery County. 186 foundations gave out 48 million in gifts and grants yearly. 516 different faith communities with over 200,000 in membership. 376 clubs, that's every PTO, Pee Wee Football League, and Kiwanis organization. Each has a mandate for good. So you have to then ask yourself a question. If our need is so great locally, but our resource pool is equally as large, where's the disconnect? The answer to that question is really the disconnect is you. The disconnect is equally me, the disconnect is all of us, and that's what I want to talk about today. You see, there's no shortage of need in the world, but equally, there is no shortage of resources. There's a shortage of translational leaders. Now let me define what that means. Translational leadership, we get leadership pounded over our head day in and day out, but understand that translational leaders, they lead their own constituency, 
but they also actively pursue an understanding of all the under, other constituencies that exist around them. They focus on understanding their own capabilities and needs, but equally, they're aware of those of the other groups with which they connect. Translational leaders pay attention to language, right, and the motivations of others, because you have to understand that collaboration begins with a common foundation, and that's translational leadership. Translational leaders embrace the complexity of our world, and frankly, they play chess. They know how to bring the parts together. Now, let me give you an example from my nonprofit work, uh, internationally and locally. So we'll start with the international story. The community of Caliche is in Honduras. Honduras is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, and Caliche is one of the poorest communities in Honduras. Now, like a lot of communities, they face a water issue. In 2009, an earthquake pushed their water source underground. That water source, when it went underground, left them with no option but to basically drink from surface pools on the south side of a cow pasture. You can imagine the illness that was going on in that community at that time. Now, the community of Caliche was in a unique position in that they weren't alone. There was a nonprofit organization that was working with them and had been working with them for several years that had uh, been in the picture helping in their schools, helping in their ministries that were working in that community. But when it came to a water problem, it was over their heads. And so they reached out to my organization, DSEC. And this is where translational leadership begins. So at DSEC, we recognized that we could probably design a technology solution and come to some end there, but there was more to it than that that needed to happen to make this a sustainable solution. So the first thing we did is we talked to the community skilled craftsmen. We encouraged them, talked to them about the value of their trades and that their leadership in uh, approaching this project, what that could bring. We spoke to a Lutheran church and engaged their ministry spirit and helped them to partner with this, uh, with this organization as well. We then spoke next to a uh, private capital. We spoke return on investment, cost-benefit analyses, and spoke the language of capital uh, to engage that in this process. We spoke to the Honduran government as well, to their engineer, helped them understand how a community-scale biosand filtration system with a low consumable demand could really help some place like Caliche. And the language we spoke to the district mayor was all about, you know, constituent votes and the ability within his electoral context to bring economic development to this area. We even brought in the University of Dayton and helped them speak the language through their Marianist spirit of service learning and engineering through the College of Engineering and engaged them in that process as well. So the community of Caliche was certainly not alone. Now, as a structural engineer, I've designed a lot of structures in my day, but one of the ones that I am most proud of is in the mountains of Caliche. This is a treatment house up in the mountains, right? This is the catchment, the source of that life-giving water for the community, three kilometers away. That community dug three kilometers of trenches, literally through bedrock in a matter of weeks, as their contribution to the project, and brought it there. And what we got out of that was a water system, improved roads back to that community, and economic development. But the biggest win here we had in Caliche was actually an empowered community, and not just the local community, but a global community that understand the value and the magnitude of impact of translational leadership. Now, we don't have to just speak about this in an international context. You can look at this just as well right here at home in Montgomery County. There's a nonprofit called Ambox, which works with uh, disabled individuals and helps give them uh, freeing devices um, to, to, you know, to have access to places they might not otherwise have access. They were working with a family in, uh, in an area locally here that had um, issues with access to their home. They couldn't get their son with cerebral palsy into their home. They were facing a number of other challenges. They brought in my group, DSEC, to help work with them on how they might uh, you know, construct a ramp. That was something that was out of their purview. So what did we do? We brought in actually the Air Force Institute of Technology out here at Wright Pat, the strong backs and disciplined leadership that exists among the lieutenants and captains uh, right here in our backyard. The American Society of Civil Engineers contributed their membership to a service activity. The big box retailers gave their 10% for charity in this. The uh, Society of American Military Engineers, through their younger members subcommittee, participated both financially and with personnel. City officials and building inspectors worked with us to give us some grace through the inspection and permitting processes. And we even had local churches doing prayer and empowerment as well in, the, in this whole process. And together we were able to produce a pretty impressive structure. There's those captains and lieutenants breaking ground um, and laying out their, our stake in the site. This is my son just making sure everything's going according to the plans. <laughs> Um, and at the end of the day, a family received a, a ramp, and uh, it looks, uh, we're, again, another structure that I'm pretty proud of as well. So my, my challenge to you, and, and the thing that I want you to think about here, is what is the problem that you're addressing, right? And what happens when you pass that problem through a lens of translational leadership? There's no shortage of need in our world. There's no shortage of resources. You need to act as a translational leader and engage it all together. Now, one more point before we finish. What is the measure of success in that? Right? The measure of success in translational leadership is actually not the knitting together of an aggregate source of resources to solve some problem. The measure of success is in replication and empowerment of others to do the same. 
You see, in Caliche, our real success was not a water system. In Caliche, our success came later when we learned that other communities in Honduras were traveling to Caliche to learn from their local leadership how they might have the same solution in their communities. Our win in Dayton is not a wheelchair ramp. Our win in Dayton is actually watching these young lieutenants and captains from the Air Force disperse in their military roles around the world, knowing that we've contributed just this little bit to their leadership capacity and wishing them well as they go. So my challenge to you is this. We talked about silos in the beginning. Consider your silo. Consider the group in which you're a part, and then consider it in the context of the myriad needs and resources of our community, and act as a translational leader. Go forth, lead, do well, and I'll see you out there. Thanks.